Hello and welcome to episode number 262 of the Armin Show podcast, where we do all the things everywhere, all the time. On this episode, we have author of The Idea of the Brain, Professor Matthew Cobb of Manchester University. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Armin. It's good to be here. This is a wonderful thing. University of Manchester, actually. I ordered it backwards. It's, it's fine. The, the, the branding people would get very cross with you, but I don't care. They're so cross with me. They're like, how could you do such a thing? Now, you're in the zoology department. You have recently released this book. I always like to check, as far as history, how did you get to go into this field of zoology? What led you there about your personality? Why do you like it? Well, I'm not, I'm not really a, we, I'm a professor, my title is Professor of Zoology, but um, I, uh, I'm not really a zoologist. I'm, uh, uh, I mean, I teach the zoology students and I've had responsibility for them, but I'm, I'm really a, a kind of neurobiologist. So I, I started off many years ago uh, when I was an undergraduate uh, as a psychology student, but that was in the days when psychology was basically neuroscience and Freud. Um, and I had lessons, I had lectures on both. Uh, and it was before really neuroscience really existed, certainly before there were any neuroscience departments or degrees. So right from the very, I, right from the very outset, I was interested in uh, how behavior occurs, why animals in particular, but also humans behave the way they do. And I ended up uh, in particular using genetics as a tool to understand that by studying uh, Drosophila, so the tiny little flies uh, that geneticists use. Uh, I was very lucky because I happened to be in one of the, about the only place in the UK and one of a handful of places in the world uh, in the mid 1970s who were actually studying uh, behavior using gen genetics in Drosophila. So that's where I, I really got interested in, uh, in, in brains. I mean, I, I don't actually study the brain. So my day job is actually studying the sense of smell uh, in, in maggots, so in baby flies. So, you know, I began working on flies in uh, 1976 and I'm still doing that. So whatever that is, a long time, 44 years later, nearly half a century later, I'm still doing it. Uh, but I now study the, uh, the baby fly, the, the larva, and we study the activity of single neurons in its nose. So this is very, very reductionist approach to try and understand some of the basic components of, um, of how behavior occurs and how nervous systems work. But I've always been interested in, uh, in history and in understanding why why things are the way they are and you can only really understand that if you take a historical approach that's true of a subject it's also true of an organism you need to understand its evolution but also its development you know its own individual history to fully understand it so it's the same with a um any understanding any scientific uh subject you need to understand it from a historical point of view so i've also uh written about various you know, historical events um, from the 17th century through to the, the 20th century. And this book is kind of the culmination of a, of a lot of that work. Mm -hmm. I noticed in the beginning of this book, and you just mentioned reductionist, you talked about Nicholas Steno, the Danish scientist, as a inspiration of sorts, in a way, of the book. Is he more of a deconstructionist or reductionist? Are they similar? What's your viewpoint on that philosophy? Is that a guiding light for most of what you do? Well, I mean, we, there's, a, there's a tension uh, in all of science, I think, um, and in particular in trying to understand the brain. Uh, and you can see this historically, and there have been these swings between trying to reduce... Uh, brain function to particular particular areas, particular structures. We've all seen these images um, of the brain lighting up when somebody's in a scanner and you know, I know they think of eating a donut and a particular part of their brain lights up. And so there's this kind of epistemological pull to think, ah, that's where the idea of donuts sits in our brain. Um, and that's just rubbish. 
So we're, we're, we've got this desire to try and localize very, very precisely because that's worked in so many other aspects of science. We know exactly where genes are. Genes aren't some mysterious force. They are very precisely located on chromosomes in the structure of DNA. So reductionism has aided us in many, many aspects. And so it, it's quite natural to try to want to put that on to use that technique with the brain. And that's, that's effectively what Steno was arguing. I mean, most neuroscientists will not have heard of him, right? Unless they were, had done a geology course and were paying a great deal of attention, they will never have heard of Steno because he's the guy who realized that he did an amazing bloke, but one of the things he realized was that where you've got layers of rock, the ones at the bottom are the old ones normally, not always, because mm -hmm. the, the earth does weird things. <laughs> but anyway, so he, he realized this, it basically invented geology, and he realized therefore that the fossils you found were remnants of the past. And anyway, he was a very, very good Christian. He went on to become a bishop. So he, his view was all the fossils you found were remnants of the flood uh, that, that kind of washed them there. Anyway, so Steno had this very much of his time, of his you know, 17th century thinker, where the universe is, people are beginning to understand the universe in mathematical terms as a kind of great clockwork machine. And he says, well, you know, I'm going to take, the brain is a kind of machine, and we can take it apart and understand what the various bits of it do. And that's essentially been the way we've proceeded for the last 350 years or so. Now, it, there is still kind of removing bits and so on and seeing what it does, but it's more uh, often these days, we can do quite astonishing things. So for example, uh, neuroscientists can now make a mouse remember something that never happened. So they can change the activity of a single set of cells, tiny little cells in the mouse's brain, and make it imagine that a particular corner of the cage, something nice happened there, so it should go there, or something nasty happened there, so it should stay away from there. So we can actually manipulate memory in a mouse's brain at a cellular level. They can turn a nice memory into a nasty one, or even get rid of the memory completely by this very fine control. So on the one hand, there's this, there's this pull that we have to want to identify very precise structures. And there's evidence, as I've just indicated, that in some way, very precise structures are involved in very complicated things. But at the same time, whenever you look at how the brain is actually organized and the brain of, of any organism is just mind bogglingly complicated, you discover that even though a particular structure might be involved in producing a particular behavior or a particular uh, ability, that it's also connected to other parts of the brain. And those connections aren't just saying, oh, well, I've, I've done my bit and passed the information upstream. They're actually functional in how that very specific behavior uh, occurs. So the localization is often uh, done on a kind of the argument, I mean, I, I, these are arguments that I had with my professors or they had with me when I was, you know, 50 years ago. So there's nothing new about this. Um, uh, and a, a man called Richard Gregory, who was a British psychologist, he wrote and thought a lot about this and said, well, look, you know, if you, if you got a radio and you remove a particular component from it, you might suddenly start getting terrible feedback from the radio. But if you then said, ah, this component is the feedback suppressor, that's its function, you know, you'd be making a really big mistake because in fact, what's happened is you've got a, a functioning ensemble and then you've taken one thing out and now it doesn't work anymore. It's going, it's going kind of crazy. Um, you can also think of it like, well, okay, a bicycle wheel, it's got spokes and you can take out lots and lots of spokes before suddenly it will collapse. So the spokes are all playing a function uh, and you may not see any change for some time. And, you know, your bike will carry on working. Eventually it will, the wheel will collapse. But you can see that by these very simple analogies that it, it's quite complicated to actually identify function by removing things, which is what Steno said we should do and what most of neuroscience has consisted of for the last kind of 50, 60 years. Mm -hmm. It's like taking the nuance away 
yeah, yeah. No one is the deal there. It's funny because, yes, you can take away things until it breaks, and then you've taken it down to that level. But the reason those little items were there, like our prefrontal cortex, they're little advanced features that add a little bit more. It's a nice thing. Yeah. That is wonderful. Now, I like that you mentioned smell, which has been popular as of recently. I want to go back to that for a moment. Yeah, uh, sure. You may have mentioned that in relation to the current pandemic affecting the sense of smell of almost everybody it impacts or a good percentage. Uh, what have been your thoughts on that? Is that related to the smell you have been studying? Um, well, I'm <laughs> My maggots don't get COVID-19, so I wouldn't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something that the whole of the smell community has been very interested in. Uh, partly, uh, well, like a lot of scientists, as soon as you see, you know, there's lots of funding going out now. So you think, aha, you know, I can pivot, as they say. I can pivot my research towards this. Now, I can't because my maggots don't get sick. But um, I have had some thoughts about it, and many of my colleagues are around the world are very interested. And it must be said first that there is a bit of an argument. So although anecdotally, it's clear that many people can uh, get changes to their sense of smell and thereby to their sense of taste because the two are very tightly connected. Uh, with this disease, it's not clear quite how specific it really is to the disease. Now, I, part of the problem is that to identify changes in smell uh, ability and sometimes this can actually be not anosmia so an inability to uh, detect smell but um, hyperosmia an increased sensitivity which is something for example that pregnant women often anecdotally report that when they're pregnant their sense of smell becomes much more sensitive but to actually nail that scientifically you need to do a set of you know, physiological tests to give people various uh, smells and to check, are you really affected by this? And is this different from just when you've got a bad cold or something? So there is a uh, part of the problem is in the US and in the UK, uh, we haven't been testing people enough for the, for the virus. So we may have people who've got very elaborate, uh, real defects in their sense of smell, but we haven't got either precise measures of that. You can then Put in a test or often do we have actually confirmation that they had COVID-19 they may have just had a you know some other other virus because viruses can affect uh, you know, people have regularly reported losing their sense of smell with various viral infections however that having been said my strong feeling partly from having <laughs> completely anecdotally having talked to a number of friends who have been confirmed with COVID-19 who have also lost their sense of smell or had a, an increased sense of smell, uh, more, more acute sense of smell, is that there is indeed a, a, a link. Now, part of the mystery as to what's going on is that we smell uh, using these cells that are in fact connected, directly connected to our brain. So really they're part of the brain. It's the only part of the brain that is actually in contact with the outside world. Uh, and they dangle down at eye level. They go through the base of your skull right up here at about the level of your eye. So it's not at all in your nostrils. You've got all these, um, you've got uh, sinuses and nasal cavities and your smell, you, you, the air goes up through there and then hits this patch of skin called the olfactory epithelium, which is dangling down through the base of your skull. Now, the olfactory epithelium is composed of these neurons, these olfactory sensory neurons, and they're what are actually doing the, the smelling. And they're the things that I'm really interested in and that I can record from uh, in my maggots. Now, those cells in mice do not have the ACE2 protein, which is what the virus uses to get into the cell. So, assuming there is a real effect, it's not directly on the ACE2, on the, on the olfactory sensory neurons. It's not that the, the, the virus is attacking them and then getting into your bloodstream and your brain and doing all the rest of the stuff. However, there are two main options, I think. The simplest one, which is probably the right one, because in general, in science, you know, Occam's razor says that less is more. The simpler explanation is the good one, mm -hmm. is that there are other cells in this layer of olfactory epithelium. There are things called sustentacular cells, which are next door, uh, which are kind of interspersed around 
in between the uh, olfactory center and neurons, and they do have the ACE2 receptor. So it's possible they're simply getting inflamed uh, because they don't like having viruses in them, they're sick, they're producing more virus, they're not doing what they should be doing, and that therefore the, uh, that's the, the consequence why we get a loss of sense of smell or altered uh, sensory uh, ability. Now there is another option, which is my theory, which is mine, as they said in Monty Python, right? <laughs> and there's no evidence for this at all, um, but it, it just struck me. Um, uh, now, proving this is gonna be very difficult, but it's to do with the way that the sense of smell works. So all the odors that we smell uh, are what are called hydrophobic. They're floating around in the air and they don't like going through liquids. That's their chemical structure means that they don't like going through liquids. Now, the problem is those smell cells I mentioned, I said they're in contact with the outside world, but they're not actually in contact with the air. They can't be, because they would die. You know, if you've got a cell that's just sitting there, out in the, in the air, it's gonna shrivel up and die. So, over our olfactory epithelium, we have a layer of mucus, kind of snotty stuff, that's got all sorts of goodies in it, all sorts of enzymes that are chipping, snipping up some odors because they're gonna harm us. So there are some odors we can't actually smell because these enzymes will snip them up in this layer of uh, mucus. And there is also, there are things called odorant binding proteins, which are kind of like a molecular chaperone. And they meet with the odor at the surface of the, the mucus layer, they protect it, they take it to the olfactory sensory neuron, and then they put the smell onto the neuron. Now, these OBPs, odorant binding proteins, are manufactured by those sustentacular cells, which are one of the targets for COVID-19 because they have the ACE2 protein on them. Now, that's just a correlation. That's just a crazy Englishman who works on maggots who's had an idea. There's no proof for that, uh, but hey, it's as good as anything else. I mean, to be honest, it doesn't really matter, um, given that we know that the virus is getting in through the ACE2 protein. That's its, you know, that's its doorway into the body. Um, so this would be an intriguing uh, route to pursue in terms of understanding our sense of smell better and how it can be affected by viruses. But I mean, it, in terms of the, uh, the, the, the pandemic, it's got no consequence whatsoever. Mm -hmm. I like that concept because I've noticed often it looks like X is a solution. It's just A to B to C, but actually it was a nuance between A to B that it's not something you think about that that's the actual solution, but you can't see it unless you look and look and look and then think about it like the way you're doing. Yeah, but as I said, I think the most likely explanation, the simplest one is it's just inflammation. There's just something boring and there's nothing else going on there. But I mean, I, and this is partly because there's a, not a dispute, but most people in the, uh, in the olfactory field, then, I mean, I'm interested in the neurons. Most people don't look at that. They get straight into the, into the brain. Um, and very few people work on these odorant binding proteins because the data on them is kind of mysterious. They seem essential, but maybe not. Um, so, you know, that's one reason why this kind of idea hasn't been particularly looked at uh, because there's a, a, a it's not so much an argument, it's just a kind of uncertainty in the field at the moment. And if you want to know more about this, because I've got more than one book to plug, um, so uh, I've got a, a, another book coming out uh, in about two weeks' time at the end of May, oh. uh, which is called Smell, A Very Short Introduction. And it's one of those little books, I've got one here, little books from Oxford University Press. Oh, those are wonderful. Uh, I've seen those. Which are, they're, yeah, they're about 140 pages long. There's, there are 500 books in this series, and they tell you anything from anatomy to zoology to quantum physics to sleep to all sorts of stuff. Anyway, so that, that, that's basically, uh, it's a very simple layperson's guide to the sense of smell in animals and man and uh, in culture as well. A lot about culture in there. There you go. End of plug. <laughs> those books right there are wonderful. I have seen a few, read a few. Very enjoyable. That's cool. On smell specifically. Yeah, that's nice. all on smell. Everybody note that. Okay. <laughs> now, that's very cool. That's, that's very specific. Now, back to the brain. What is the idea of the brain based on the book, if you had to culminate that concept? 
Okay, so it's, it's a history of how we have conceived of brain function. So it is not um, a history of anatomical discoveries because you know what, I'm, an, I'm not an anatomist. And above all, I'm interested in all kinds of brain. I, I mean, it's not about the human brain. Just, I mean, there's a lot about the human brain because a lot of people are interested in it. But uh, it's about the brain as a concept. What is a brain, uh, whether it be in a maggot or in a human? And how have people conceived of it? How have they thought it's worked over history and in the future? And the main way, what, what's interesting, what I found fascinating as I was writing the book, is that always people use metaphors, analogies, to describe what they think the brain is doing and how it's doing it. And those metaphors and, and analogies come from machinery. So the earliest uh, idea was Descartes, who in the, 19, the 1650s, or sorry, 1630s, was walking around Paris um, gardens, public gardens, and they had these uh, mechanical statues, kind of animatronic, hydraulic powered statues that would emerge from the, the undergrowth and uh, would wave at you, or they would play a, a flute, um, or a dragon would fight Samson and stuff like that. And so he, I mean, he knew they were all worked by hydraulic. He, he wasn't scared of them or anything, but he thought, well, we've got these tubes in us and our nerves. Maybe there's something going down the nerves like water, like hydraulic pressure. So he came up with this theory of how the brain works based on hydraulics. I mean, that was completely wrong and people could show it very quickly because there's no kind of pressurized fluid in nerves, but he was trying to, he was trying to work it out. Um, Later on, people, especially after the development of the discovery of electricity, then people looked at the brain like a telegraph network or the brain and its nervous system. If you imagine, you know, the, the telegraph wires stretching out across America, across the whole continent, you can get information from New York to Los Angeles or vice versa. And yeah, that looks pretty much like the brain and the nervous system. And then with the development of the telephone exchange, which is where the, con the connections are conditional, the connections change depending on where you want to send the message. Then people started to argue, well, really, because there is this flexibility in the brain, it's not all hardwired. Maybe that's what's going on. Maybe learning is one of these roots just getting kind of gradually fixed rather than being connected or, or not connected. And of course, the final metaphor, the one that we use today, has been around for a long time, and that's the computer. And that's been around since the 1950s. Um, although, in, in fact, bizarrely, although now we say, well, the brain's like a computer, uh, when the computer was first developed, the digital computer, by uh, von Neumann in the 1940s, he used discoveries from uh, embryonic neuroscience to persuade the US government that he should build his computer. Because he said, look, this is how a brain works. We're gonna build a computer that works like that. So in its initial stages, the computer was like a brain. And he literally used this analogy in the other direction. Now, very soon people realized that it didn't really work that way, but we've got a, a, a we still use that metaphor of the brain is like a computer, it's carrying out computations as a way of trying to frame our understanding. And so this sequence of links between technology and discovery actually then leads you to think about the future. <laughs> because if at each stage our ideas, the experiments we can think of have been not determined, but framed, generally shaped by the technology of the time, then that means that in the future, when our technology changes and we've got new ways of manipulating information and matter, then our ideas are going to change, our ideas about the brain. The data we have at some of the data we have at the moment will be reinterpreted in the light of that future technology. Now, when I say that to scientists, they, 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 they pick up on that really quickly and get very excited. And they say to me, right, so, so what is it? What's the next big thing? To which the answer is, if I knew that, I'd be very rich. 
<laughs> and wouldn't be here. So I've no idea, but we know things will change. Mm -hmm. Just the stepwise process. We keep looking at it slightly differently based on what technology we have at the moment. I like that in your book, you broke it down into past, present, and future. The past leading up to the 19th century, what we thought of things, similar to how you're describing the uh, tubes that are hydraulic, and then so on, neurons, machines. And then now we have things such as circuits, and then localization, and then consciousness. What is your current view of consciousness? How do you think about uh, it? Well, yeah, I, I, I mean, it always sounds bizarre, and people get a bit disappointed. I'm not really interested in consciousness um, for the simple reason that I don't think it's a doable problem. So I'm very happy to leave it to the philosophers personally. Um, I mean, you know, there's a, a bit of philosophy bashing in the book, uh, but it mo I, I do also point out that, you know, the philosophers have been worrying about two things, two fundamental things for 3000 years. And science still hasn't got the answer to those two things. And those two questions are, one, what is the universe made of? And, you know, we now don't know what, nine, you know, whatever it is, 75% of it is made of dark matter, and we don't know what that is, dark energy. So we don't know what the universe is made of. And the other question we don't understand is how consciousness emerges from our brains. Uh, so, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm being facetious. I do think it's an interesting problem. Um, but I don't think it's one that we have got a hope in hell of answering for centuries. And the, the challenge for those, I mean, there are plenty of very clever people. People are much cleverer than me who've got, you know, complicated theories, most of them very, very mathematical, looking at very high level explanations of, 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 of how consciousness can emerge. But you see, I, that's the problem is I work on maggots. And I work on very simple nervous systems and I don't understand them. And the, the, the classic example, which I use a number of times of this in, the, in this book, um, is the work of Eve Marder at Brandeis University. And Eve Marder has, for the last two, three decades, uh, been studying the lobster's stomach. Now the lobster's stomach has 30 neurons, more or less. And these neurons are connected and they produce a rhythmic activity which enables the stomach to grind up its food. That's all they do. They produce a number of these rhythms in different kind of patterns and the whole network can switch from one to the other. And we know everything about the cells that are in that network. We know how they're connected. Uh, we can model them. We can record from them. And yet, despite all that knowledge, Professor Marda still can't be confident using say a computer model, if I take out neuron A, how will the pattern of activity change? She can't be, she can't be certain of that. I, we don't fully understand the lobster's stomach. Mm -hmm. So my view is if we don't get that, <laughs> the idea of trying to imagine, understand how you know, ideas are emerging in my brain. Um, I mean, yeah, I don't think people, I'm not against people researching it. I, I just don't think that anything of any great interest will come of it and there's a challenge to the the theoreticians rather than working at this very high level uh of trying to understand the human brain use your models to try and understand simpler brains where we have nearly a whole connectome we know exactly how everything's connected and we're nearly there with the maggot it will be completed it's about ten thousand neurons it'll be completed in the next three two three years and that, I think, see if your models can predict the very, very simple behavior of a maggot. If they can, then we can start, they, then you can be confident, well, this is right or wrong, or we can then start apply that to more complex views. So you can see that I am, in a way, a profound reductionist, <laughs> because I want to be able to understand things in terms of the activity of their component parts. But I also recognize that the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And it may be very difficult to get from, you know, a simple analysis to a, a more complex one. But ultimately that's what we've got to be able to do, whether it's in a lobster's stomach or a maggot's brain or, or yours. Mm -hmm. One thing that comes to mind related to that is, what would be your guess as far as, let's say you 
had a full sense of the maggot's brain, the neuronal connections, and what that lead, how that leads to its movements and processing. How how far along would that be to understanding ours? What percentage would figuring that out connect with us? Well, I mean, you could take it as a simple kind of linear thing. So we've maggots got ten thousand. We've got eighty billion. Mm -hmm. So that's whatever it is. Point oh 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 eight percent right and of course it's going to be much less than that right. because with increased complexity then you do get emergent properties that you can't necessarily uh predict however um i suspect i mean i'm getting as i've got older i've got a bit kind of hippy dippier and less uh you know less hardline than i used to be when i was younger and uh, in, in in the book i'm I'm prepared to talk about the mind of the maggot, not just making jokes, but actually, um, you know, maybe, I mean, I don't, I don't think they're conscious, like we're certainly not like we are, um, but maybe even very simple nervous systems do have some, you know, reflective representation of their state, which is something like what consciousness is that enables the brain to actually question its status and what it's going to do and to predict what might happen if it does one thing or if it does another. Um, so maybe it would get us further along than, than I imagine. Um, on the other hand, it's, it, it, it's those simple systems are kind of the test bed, I think, upon which you can begin to understand or acquire the tools to be able to explain more complex systems. Mm -hmm. Like a proof of concept. Yeah. That's wonderful. One thing that comes to mind, uh, what are the most important brain functions in a maggot? In the maggot? Well, um, the main thing it's got to do is to know where it is. Well, a maggot is, you know, is one of the reasons why I'm interested in them is they're really simple and they are pretty stupid. <laughs> uh, I mean, they can learn. But in general, they probably don't in the wild. I mean, you know, nothing much happens. They only live a few days because then they're going to turn into a fly. But they need to know where they are, uh, what's around them. So in particular, food and potential uh, enemies. So one of the things that's become clear in the last few years, um, one of, we, we were working on one, on, on, they've got 21 smell cells, the market, just 21. You've got 4 million. Right. So they're really, really simple. And we can make a maggot with just one functioning smell cell in its nose. And there was one particular cell which didn't seem to make much sense. We, we could occasionally get responses from it to some odors, but it, it didn't respond in the way the others did. Um, and this has recently been shown uh, by my colleague in Sweden, Marcus Stensmeyer, to in fact, this particular cell, a single cell on the maggot's nose, detects the smell of a parasitoid wasp. Because one of the dangers for a maggot is you're gonna get somebody laying an egg in you, like an alien, right? So you don't want, it, you don't want that to happen. It's gonna end very badly. You're gonna have a load of wasps bursting out of you and you're dead. So the maggot can smell the smell of the, the, the wasp produces a particular odor and it has one cell that is very precisely tuned to the smell of the wasp. And if it can smell the wasp, it will start to get agitated and move away. Similarly, if the wasp tries to, um, tries to uh, lay its egg in it with its kind of stingy thing, then the maggot will roll away. And you can study this using a pin. If you poke a maggot, it will roll away. And that sequence of behaviors from uh, detecting a, a, a pinprick to moving away, we can now, we have virtually completely understood. So they've got the connectome for this particular set of sequences and uh, colleagues both in at uh, Genelia Research uh, Center in Virginia, but also they've now moved to Cambridge in the UK, have been working on this and have begun to, they've, they've nearly completely understood it in a way similar to the attempts to understand the lobster's stomach uh, but probably because it's a much simpler behavior rather than a kind of rhythm, it's, you know, move here, stretch this muscle, pull this, turn over kind of sequence that you can, you can imagine, you know, writing a flow diagram for, um, they've nearly nailed it. So basically that's what a maggot needs to know where it is. Is there food there? 
Is there an enemy there? Uh, are there other maggots around? Because they like to eat um, socially, so there's some evidence that they can detect other individuals and they will aggregate on the basis of the smell of other individuals. Um, and they are, I mean, they are paying attention to the world and some of that information gets transferred into the adult. So there's been a number of studies in different insects suggesting that if you train a caterpillar or a maggot in a particular way to associate particular food with reward, then the, the adult insect will remember that because the, the, the brain doesn't completely dissolve. It's kind of used as the, the larval brain is used as the scaffolding to build the adult brain. So you can get this transfer of memory. So they're remembering stuff as well. Above all, however, what the maggot's really doing, the most important, probably the most significant thing that we've discovered it's doing is it's telling the time. Oh. So a maggot knows whether it's night or day. Okay, so it has a clock, a biological clock that starts ticking. And that's similarly present in the fly. The fly emerges first thing in the morning and it knows what time of day it is because it's got this biological clock. And uh, in terms of the history, we know about biological clocks in humans because they were studied in Drosophila in flies. Okay. So uh, Seymour Benzer, one of the founders of this field of uh, Drosophila neurogenetics, he was able to identify a gene that encoded a clock in a fly. And it turned out, I think to everybody's amazement, it's the same gene basically in you and me. So in all animals have got these clocks. And this is an example of the power of this reductionist approach. Seymour took a really complicated phenomenon and, and well, he bet the farm that there was gonna be a, a, a single gene. I think everybody thought this was crazy. Uh, well, they, they did, they said lots of rude things about him. But he turned out to be right, and even righter than he could have imagined, I think, because it's basically the same system in all animals. So that's one of the things that a maggot is doing, it's telling the time. Mm. That is pretty amazing. I got, I'm sorry, I went off, I, went, I got sidetracked there, but I couldn't, I couldn't not tell you that story. That is wonderful. It is really cool that one gene can encode that, like a clock. The amount of things that we copy from things that were already encoded in us or other animals is pretty interesting or plants we use plant techniques for what we use for buildings whatnot that's somewhat neat what is uh, one of the when you think of maggots what is uh, something that has been challenging to study in them is there something difficult about them like their short-lived time yeah, frame? they're very very small <laughs> so i mean these aren't you know the, 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 a, a maggot brain is about the size of a full stop on a on a page um, and the, 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 the neurons that we study are really, really tiny. Um, they're much, much smaller than anything in a, in a mouse brain, for example. So they're not quite as densely packed, but they are very, very small. So one of the problems that we've had has been uh, re coming up with a, uh, an image of what the maggot is smelling at the very first stages, how those neurons are responding to different smells and how it then puts those together in a first kind of image. That's the wrong word, but I don't have a, there's no olfactory, there's no smell word, but you know, a smell image, a thing, a representation of that smell at the very earliest stages. Um, and that's partly because Basically, there are infinite number of smells that we can detect. I mean, scientists, there's been a lot of argument about this in humans, but um, it's probably an infinite number. I mean, there was a, a measure was, a paper came out about five, six years ago, suggesting that we could send humans, can detect a trillion different odors, a trillion. Now, that was based on a model, based on a certain, you know, people distinguishing a certain number of odors and then kind of scaling it up. And the mathematicians got very cross and said, you people don't understand anything about maths. And so we got crossed back and said, you people don't understand anything about biology or chemistry. I mean, the number really doesn't matter and the details of the model don't matter. It, I think effectively it's infinite. So to take the example of, of our mysterious neuron that didn't seem to respond to anything, uh, I mean, we, would, we could have searched forever <laughs> trying to find out what this neuron was, was interested in. 
mm -hmm. we'd have known that it was interested in something very very specific because none of the kind of general fruity smells or decaying smells seem to excite it um but i don't think i would ever have guessed that it was the smell of a, a parasitoid wasp once you know that it makes perfect sense <laughs> but uh, identifying that would have been very difficult it's sort of like sometimes you have to look at exactly what would have impacted that organism evolutionarily and that's where that would have yeah and that's what they, they were interested is my, my colleagues were were looking at how the maggots responded to the uh, to the wasps and they noted and they were interested in what the wasps might smell of and so they went about it the other way around they weren't trying to establish kind of a a, a full profile for each of the maggots 21 smell cells they they were interested in function first i i, I think that's that's the way to get at cool functions <laughs> interesting exciting things that are very specific and tell you something about uh, evolution and biology okay. long live evolutionary biology and speaking of that actually how connected is your region to evolutionary biology like the uk that area as far as research is that like a specific hotbed would you think of it like that um well i mean the big thing in uh, evolutionary biology these days i think increasingly so is using genomics um and understand trying to compare species i mean so you know you, you introduce me as a zoologist well one of the reasons why i'm not a zoologist is that if somebody shows me a bone i have no idea where it comes from you know i mean i might say it's a, a rodent or you know i mean I, i'm hopeless in the old days zoology students would be given as part of their final exam would be given a load of bones and they'd have to be able to identify where they were came from so that's you know a very vertebrate uh, structural approach to understanding animals these days what people tend to do is to look at the genes because we can we can identify you know we can extract dna from long dead animals from animals that have died the record i think is about half a million years from uh, a horse that was uh, uh, stuck in the tundra, so it's frozen. So it's, yeah, it's good quality DNA. It hadn't been eaten by bacteria, which is what normally what happens. So we can extend, we can collect DNA from you know ancient animals, and that is increasingly how scientists are studying the relationship between animals using computer programs to create new trees of life to find the connections between them. Uh, and in our case, the case of human evolution, which is something I'm particularly interested in, to understand, say, that we interbred with extinct groups like the Neanderthals or the mysterious Denisovans who lived out in the Far East and in Siberia, um, or even peoples that we have no evidence for except from their DNA. So people, indigenous people in Africa, have stretches of DNA that you and I don't have. And they have it because their ancestors mated with, we don't know who they were, but they're, they're, they've gone extinct. They've disappeared. Somewhere in Africa, there are fossils of these people, just as we have Neanderthal fossils. And we know that uh, probably about 4% of my DNA uh, comes from the Neanderthals, because when we went into the Middle East and uh, into uh, Europe, we mated with the Neanderthals and we exchanged genes. So increasingly, uh this kind of study is shedding new lights on evolution and that's something uh to get back to your question uh that my colleagues in particular uh in manchester are, are, are very strong we're perhaps not so hot on identifying bones but we are good at looking at dna sequences that's cool i've seen so much cool research in evolutionary biology from scotland or the uk in general it's nice oh feature. yeah, the, the UK has a very good tr tradition. Manchester is much more uh, molecular, but there are some fantastic uh, organisms, you know, places that actually go out and work in the field and you know get get their boots dirty, and then they come back and they extract the DNA and they do all the comparisons. But yeah, as you said, in particular, St Andrews and Edinburgh uh, are two very strong universities in that respect. Now, one thing I wanted to bring up, which is cool, I just noted it. Uh, right before that I didn't listen to it, but you did an episode with Michael Shermer, who I've once interviewed uh, about his books, The Moral Arc and Skeptic. And it came to mind to check in your research along the way, how much 
have you been a skeptic of what was told to you versus how much did you go along with what people had provided and then build on that? Well, yeah, so the Royal Society in London, which is the world's oldest scientific society, um, has as its motto, nullius in verbia in Latin, which basically means don't take anybody's word for it. But, of course, you have to, <laughs> you know, so part of the, I mean, we can see this with all the, the preprints that are coming out now. Uh, these are papers that haven't been peer reviewed. So, uh, on the on the virus people are putting onto servers and they haven't been looked at by anybody now peer review is no guarantee that a paper is correct it just means that normally uh the most egregious errors have been removed from the paper by somebody reading it and going wait a minute this doesn't make sense or this isn't a an, you know an appropriate conclusion or your methods are wrong how can you conclude this if you did it this way but um, in the end, so being critical is the first thing that a, you know, a scientist has to be. But of course, there's lots of literature which we accept. And the more it becomes solid, the harder it is to criticize this. And there's, I'll give you one very telling example, and I, I still don't know what to make of it. So uh, until I, I said I've just published this smell book at the very last stage of the proof. So just before they press send and when it went off to the printer, I had to remove a few paragraphs from this because uh, I was writing about uh, a set of work that's been done for the last decade or so, which I've been very interested in, which has looked at how increasing carbon dioxide levels in the water, in the sea, alter the olfactory system of fish because fish have a sense of smell as well and so there's this great body of work um, showing that increased acidity because that's what happens as co2 goes into the sea the, the 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 acidity increases because it's becoming carbonic acid in fact um, and that, that alters the activity of the the sensory neurons in the fish. So they can't, they can't smell prey, they can't smell uh, predators, they can't find their way home. In, in a famous experiment, Nemo, uh, poor old Nemo, who has to go back to the, the reef at night to sleep in the anemones, just like in the film, these in the laboratory where they had increased CO2 levels and therefore increased acidity, the fish got lost. They couldn't find their way home. So this is all very worrying and adds to the general worry about CO2 levels um, and the, the horror of climate change. However, earlier this year, a big paper came out by some researchers who wanted to use this technique. They wanted to discover exactly how it worked at the molecular level. And so they, the first thing you do is to replicate the experiment. You do it in your lab. It didn't work. They tried with various fish, it didn't work. They couldn't do it with all the same fish that the other group had done. In particular, they couldn't use clownfish, Nemo, but the experiment didn't work. And they did it over and over again in various ways with much larger data sets, with computer-based analysis of behavior. So the people who were looking, recording the behavior didn't know what the experiment was and they did it really, really carefully and there was nothing zilch no effect at all which is good news because it means that perhaps co2 is not going to affect fish in the way we're worried about but it's very bad news in that it looks like uh, i mean there's no suggestion of uh, any malfeasance that the researchers involved did anything wrong but they probably fooled themselves and as uh, Feynman said there's nobody easier to fool than yourself you know one of the things that you, you, you learn as a researcher is when students are doing experiments, you say, stop now, <laughs> it's looking good. Don't do another experiment, it'll all go wrong. So I guess that what, I mean, the researcher in question, I haven't named, I don't wanna, I'm not hitting on him because I've got a lot of time for him. Uh, I mean, he said, well, you didn't use the same techniques, didn't use exactly the same fish. My feeling is if, it requires, if it's something so pernickety as it will only work in one species and not in another and with one measure and not another, then it's not a big effect. 
in which case we don't have so much to worry about. So that kind of makes the point for these uh, researchers. So that was an example of a, a negative result. I and mean, it's published in Nature, which is one of the big two scientific journals. And they, they virtually never publish negative results because people can always say, well, you didn't do this right, or you didn't do that right. But it does look as though the researchers fooled themselves, the original researchers. And, you know, I've read his papers. It made perfect sense. Yeah, why not? Um, I mean, it may turn out that he's right, but I wasn't, you know, I decided I really had to take it out of my book. I couldn't, you know, uh, because somebody else had said, well, wait a minute. But th their starting point was to replicate it. They didn't start out to trash somebody. Uh, and they were, I think, quite upset and disturbed when they found that they couldn't replicate the result. You had to make a quick game time decision there right before the release. Yeah. I cleared that up. This cannot go in. I don't feel good about it. That makes sense. Those books are so cool. I just have to point that out. They're very enjoyable to, you feel like you're in a different category where you're just taking a quick class and it's fun. That's yeah, nice. yeah, they're great. One thing I always like to check in conclusion is if you had a megaphone to the billions of people on the planet, what is something you'd want them to know about what you have studied or the work you have done? Um, well, I, I think on a global scale, I think it will probably be, uh, which isn't directly my work, but I think the most important things is where uh, evolution is true. Evolution by natural selection explains adaptations. Um, and uh, yeah, don't be afraid of vaccines because <laughs> uh, we're going to need one very soon because the world is in a terrible mess. Uh, and it was interesting, you know, the, the 8th of May the other day, uh, people were celebrating the end of the war in Europe, which clearly wasn't the end of the Second World War because it carried on in Japan and lots of Japanese people were going to lose their lives and Americans uh, in the fighting out in the Far East. But they, we celebrated the defeat of Nazi Germany. Uh, seven, eight, 80 years earlier. But May the 8th was also the 40th anniversary of the elimination of smallpox. So that's when the World Health Organization declared smallpox extinct. So that's the only disease in humans that we've eradicated. There's one other disease in animals called rinderpest, which is a cattle virus which we uh, got rid of using vaccines as well. But smallpox is the only human disease we've eradicated by a global campaign of vaccination. And it worked and nothing horrible happened. And that's one of the greatest achievements of the 20th century. That one right there is a wonderful example and very fitting for this current moment. Professor Cobb, I would like to thank you for having been on this episode of the show. Thank you very much. It's been great being here. This is fabulous. And we are out.